Amen, and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. John Roberts, and I'd like to welcome you to our Holy Week services. And it says, this is the week that changed the world. On behalf of the presiding prelate of the Ninth Episcopal District, the Right Reverend Harry L. C. Wright, on behalf of Dr. the Reverend Dr. Letitia Watford, presiding elder at Tuskegee District, Reverend Dr. Willie, Reverend Dr. Eugene Marshall, presiding elder of the Ozark District, all presiding elders, all pastors, and all bishops that are in attendance tonight, we greet you in the name of our Heavenly Father. As Psalms 34 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Just today was Palm Sunday. And they had palms singing Hosanna, Hosanna to Christ the King. Well, we are here today to begin our Holy Week services. We will follow the order that is before you now on the screen. This, ser this service is being hosted by Pastor Reverend Matty Edwards and Reverend Monique Summers. The order of service that will be selection by Sister Sheila Jackson and friends Prayer by Elder Willie Marshall. Prayer response, Sister Priscilla Winfield. Scripture by Reverend Dr. Clementine Warren. And the offertory appeal by Sister Linda Carter. After the offertory appeal, I will come back and do the remainder of the program. Thank you, Sister, Sister Jackson. Yes, sir. <laughs> Blessed assurance, the of his mouth. Oh, what a Let us pray. Almighty God, we know that both in life and in death, we belong to you. And oh Lord, as we journey with Jesus of Christ to the cross during this week, Lord, please, please increase our hope that death will not get the final word mm. as long as earth is held under your constant watch. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray, continue to pray for the African Methodist Episcopal Church as a whole. In addition to that, we pray for our messengers, these mighty women, women of God, Bishop Ann Henning Byfield and Bishop Carolyn Tyler Gittry on tonight. Give them preaching power. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
تمام Our scripture will be coming from Hebrew, Hebrew 9th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us for if the blood of bull and goat and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to god purge your country from dead works the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to Thanks God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good afternoon, each and every one, to our Bishop of the Ninth Episcopal District, the Reverend Wright, Rep Bishop Harry L. C. Wright to the Reverend uh, Sarita Moon C. Wright, our Episcopal Supervisor, to uh, our Elder Willie Marshall, to our own Elder Leticia Wofford, to all pastors on this district and others. My uh, appeal this, my job this afternoon is, is appeal for your offering. We are asking, they didn't say, an amount, but I am asking for at least $25 from each individual who can. And to be able to do this, you may send by Cash App, which is dollar sign Holy Week 2024. Again, that's dollar sign Holy Week 2024. Or you may mail your check to the St. Luke AME Church, P.O. Box 4138, Opelika, Alabama, 36803. Again, we thank you for this will be a wonderful week, and I know that we will all be blessed. Amen. Have a good afternoon. Amen. We'd like to thank Sister Carter for that offertory appeal. And at this time, we are going to ask the Reverend Sherita Moon Seawright, the 9th Episcopal District WMS Supervisor, to present the Bishop of the 9th Episcopal District, who will in turn introduce the preachers for the hour. And after the introduction of the preachers for the hour, there will be another selection by Sister Sheila Jackson, and then the proclamation of the word. Supervisor Seawright. 
Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Good evening, everyone. Uh, to Bishop Adam Jefferson Richardson, the Senior Bishop of AME Church, to Bishops Carolyn Tyler Guidry and Bishop Ann Henning Byfield, and to the presiding elders, the pastors, ministers, laity, and component leaders, and anyone else who might be gathered tonight uh, for this first service of Holy Week. It is my task to present the bishop or tonight of the Ninth District. Bishop Harry L. Seawright was born in North, North South Carolina to Joe Nathan and Mary Seawright. He is the youngest child and he grew up in Swansea, South Carolina. He is a graduate of St. Matthew's High School, Benedict College, Howard University School of Divinity, and participated in the Oxford University Roundtable. He's a family man to his siblings, his nieces, his nephews, his many cousins. He is the proud granddaddy of Cameron Isaiah, the proud father, Sherry <clears throat> and Matthew, and the awesome husband to me. In 2016, he was elected and consecrated the 133rd elect, uh, Bishop of the AME Church and was assigned to the 9th Episcopal District, the state of Al Alabama, where I can honestly say that he has served with integrity and a will to do what God has called him to do, and that mm -hmm. is to serve the people. I present to you now, Bishop Harry Lee Seawright, presiding prelate of the state of Alabama, 9th Episcopal District. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Thank you, mm -hmm. Reverend Sharita. It is always a joy to be introduced mm -hmm. you by your wife. And I thank her for her kind words of presentation. <laughs> I come this evening giving thanks to God for the privilege of greeting each of you. We are all happy to be alive. We are all happy to be in the number one more time. We are all happy <laughs> to be a part of this Holy Week presentation. We want to give a special thanks to our senior bishop and honor him tonight, Bishop Adam Jefferson Richardson, and to the two bishops that we shall introduce in a few moments. We thank our, all of the Episcopal supervisors, including the Reverend Sharita Moon Seawright. She has done a wonderful job in establishing protocol, so I won't try to reestablish it. But we are grateful for this privilege. We want to say a special mm -hmm. thanks to Reverend Pastor Maddie Evers, mm -hmm. as well as Reverend Monique Summons for the hard work that you have done pulling this presentation together. Thank you all so much for all of the churches from your church, uh, St. Paul and St. Luke AME churches. We also want to thank those wonderful members of those churches. We want to thank the IT team, all the people who have made it possible for us to connect tonight in a virtual setting. We come to present two dynamic women uh, bishops of the church. I am honored. Well, I believe that Bishop uh, Byfield and Byfield will be going first. Oh, my, one of my classmates, praise the Lord. We thank God for her being elected the 135th Bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She is a phenomenal woman. She leads the 13th Episcopal District, has once served the 16th Episcopal District, has done it all in with distinction. Uh, she has led us, she has made us proud in so many ways in African Methodism. She has written songs. She has done so many marvelous things. And she is leading the 13th Episcopal District to higher height. She is getting ready to come to the, the end of her tenure as an active bishop. But knowing the energy and the hope and the assurances that Bishop Ann Hennon Bafia bring to the bench as well as to uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church and Christendom. We just know that she is not going to sit still. She still will be, continue to do the great work of the Lord. She is, is for the first time in the history of the Afri African Methodist Episcopal Church, she was elected a bishop, uh, and her brother also was elected a bishop, and it was all done while he was fulfilling his tenure as a bishop and getting ready to retire. So we praise the Lord for her tonight. 
the history that she continues to make. And she is married to a wonderful man of God. We praise the Lord for her husband, uh, whose brother by Theo, who stands wonderfully by her side. And then our next preacher tonight will be Bishop Carolyn Tyler Gittry. We all know her in the Ninth Episcopal District as a great assistant to the bishop. We praise the Lord for her work. She made history by being the second woman to be elected to the office of bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She is the 122nd bishop. She served well. She served also in the 16th Episcopal District, the 8th Episcopal District, and continues to serve as a great mentor and leader to women in ministry. She serves in many capacities. She assists many bishops in annual conferences. She, we call her the mother of the board. We thank God for her wonderful advice, for her love, her sincerity as well as the hope that she brings to so many people. She has overcome a lot, but she knows it's all because of the love and the favor of God. So as we come tonight, we are excited. And Reverend Maddie Evers has a unique way of pulling bishops together. She has a unique way of inviting bishops. And so if you know the lineup, on tomorrow night, we're going to have the senior bishop himself bringing a word. And then on Wednesday night, we are going to have Bishop uh, Beeman bringing the word. So we will introduce them at that time. But we are just glad and thank you, Reverend Maddie Evers, for your stellar leadership as we come tonight. Please hear them as they shall come after each other bringing a word tonight on this holy week. God bless you. Oh, 
Amen. Now it is time for the preached word. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good evening to everybody. We're glad that you are here and a part of this event. We are here to celebrate the goodness of God, the life and joy of Jesus, and to begin this holy week. We are grateful that God has moved us in a way in which um, we can celebrate and do what God has called us to do. To Reverend Maddie Edwards and to Reverend Monique Summers, who have the boldness to invite four preachers every year to come and preach, we are excited and delighted that you are able to be on, um, to be with us and to invite us to my um, former colleagues, presiding elders, El Elders Letitia Wofford and Willie Marshalls and other presiding elders that are on, to Bishop Harry Seawright, my classmate, and to Supervisor Seawright, we greet you in Jesus' joy, to Senior Bishop um, Richardson, and to my colleague in this event, and my colleague in ministry, and on the bench, Bishop Carolyn Tyler Guidry, and to all of you who have assembled. Um, turn with me to um, Matthew 21, the 23rd through the 27th verse. We're going to be infusing um, the um, rest of that um, chapter um, in a way in which um, we can understand and see um, what God has for us to do. Is there any way that I can be on the screen, um, whoever's handling um, um, that? So, okay, well, we'll go, we'll. Do you need to share your screen? No, I just need to be, whoever's doing it, I just need to be put on the screen. You are on the screen. Okay, all right, I can't see myself. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was preaching and said about what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of, of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as the prophet. So they answered John, I mean, they answered Jesus and said, we do not know. And he said to them, and neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. For a subject, first things first. First things first. First, mm, mm. the story of, John, of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem is what we call um, Palm Sunday and begins what we call Passion Week. Many of the Old Testament prophecies were demonstrated in the prediction of the singular event of, of the Messiah coming into Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a hard nut to crack. It was the center, the urban center, the place where rural and suburban persons came. Because so many people came to Jerusalem to work, the city was overpopulated, and the food supply of the farms were not sustaining. The farming residents, um, those who were not in the city, were now providing food for the urban area. Many younger people saw that the industry of their parents compromised, and they also moved in the city. Jerusalem was a mixed bag of rich, high religious leaders, merchants, and people of all nations. And Jesus' responsibility this week was to prepare 
for his crucifixion and prepare the people for the truth and confront the religious hierarchies. Leaders that created havoc, confusion, district, and whose rules and actions disenfranchised a large group of residents, now seeing those people following Jesus and calling him the Messiah. Jesus had been accused in the past of being under the spell of Beelzebub, Beelzebub to be able to cast out demons. And now in Jerusalem, the question is raised again as he clears out the temple. Who are you and under what authority? Initially, when they asked this question, many um, at the beginning of his ministry, it was a question of deliverance. Now it's a, a question of confrontation because he is coming to their territory and he is doing what they knew a Messiah could do. And who could do this but a Messiah? But he could not be the Messiah. So the question was, who are you and under what authority? This was a question for them, and it is a fundamental question for the Monday of Holy Week. Much like Jesus questions Peter regarding who do you say I am, how do we proceed this week based on our answer? Their question was to entrap him because he is not the Messiah in their estimation. And no matter how he answered, there was no correct answer. You know the old question, do you still beat your wife? If you say no, are you saying at one time you did? And if you say yes, you have given the question the ammunition. So true to Jesus' pattern, he never allows himself to be set up. This is a rule that my parents taught me early. Only they said that you don't have to answer every question other than the questions we ask you. And so we caught this woman in the act, they said to Jesus, and what are you going to do? Was Jesus baptism, John's baptism from heaven, or was it from human origin? They knew that John the baptizer and Jesus were so closely related physically and spiritually. If John was indeed the prophet preparing the way for Jesus, then Jesus is the one who is to come, who is the Messiah. Monday is already the culmination of major events, and we haven't yet seen the worst of the worst. Monday is a quiet day for those who work all weekend and an energetic day for those who didn't and starting their day off. It is always for Jesus an ultimate showdown. First things first, can you ask and answer the question who Jesus is and what authority he has over you and the world? You should be able to say with confidence, he is God who came in the flesh. He is the savior of the world. I know him because he saved me. You must know who Jesus is because you will listen to people who will give you a misguided understanding. Some people will tell you that Jesus is a mean savior judging all people who live in sin according to their particular beliefs. They will designate the sin, determine the punishment, and feel that we cannot have any association with them. If you listen to Jesus, some people, Jesus is white and came only to save white people. Or Jesus is a conservative who believes in segregation, condemns Gaza and not Israel. And others would tell you that Jesus has no boundaries and you can do whatever you want to do when you want to do it. But if Jesus is the savior of the world, then he had to come to make sure that the temple, the very place of the center of religious community, individually and collectively was clean. We had to know that the court of the Gentiles was evangelistic. The court of the Gentiles was not just a part of the temple. It was a place where the Gentiles who were just learning about Jesus or seeking the Jewish faith, not Jesus, the Jewish faith, the Messiah. It was a place where they would be able to come and the rabbis and the leaders will help them find their way to beliefs. But religious leaders, instead of creating a learning capacity created a Jew and a marketplace. They made their money off of Gentiles and others who didn't have appropriate sacrifices. They sold souvenirs and profited off of people's miseries and sin. And we understand when the one place we should represent the holiness of God is not the place where God is made holy. It is a place where people profit and not profess. People sell forgiveness but don't teach faith. And you can buy grace, but you can't receive it. And so even in this day, we can have chili suppers, hat shows, barbecue dinners, and, and sneaker balls, 
but can't get a few people to attend on Zoom for praise and prayer. And we wonder why the church has lost levels of spirituality. We water down sound teaching because we are afraid to tell the people the truth. We fill the temple with stuff that the needed, the unwanted, the children, the neglected ones, the disenfranchised, the true seekers are given something that does not last. This was the second time Jesus cleaned this temple, and this time it was different. It was a place of true cleansing. It was the announcement that the true Messiah has emerged to be a part of us. And fellowship to Jesus is true submission. Fellowship of Jesus is to continue that you know that God will get to the root of our negative action, root of our love for greed, root to our love for power, root to our lack of true knowledge. And so our temple and the church must decide who is Jesus and under, under what authority would we declare. And I declare to say to you that Jesus is God. God is the noun, the verb, and the modifier. God is a source of a pure heart. God is a source of a true salvation. So this Monday of Holy Week, it is the beginning of restoration, a restoration with God and a promise to deliver us from my enemies. This Monday is a promise of restoration, that God will cleanse our own temple and our church if we allow him. Monday is the time to recognize that this is a difficult process. One must be clean. One must be exposed. One must go through attempted scandals. One must be betrayed, lied on, and ultimately crucified until there is a reality that God is the ultimate power. So Monday is not a place of just restoration. It's a place of rejoicing when you know God is in charge. First things first, that Jesus is the authority. And through Jesus, we can go through the pruning process. Through Jesus, we know that we can get back our lives. We know through Jesus that we can come back to life spiritually and physically. Through Jesus, we know that there's healing in the temple. And through Jesus, we know that women can be delivered, men can be delivered. Through Jesus, the temple is more than a pious ritualistic focus on the liturgy, but not on the Lord. Through Jesus, we know that we can have a licking, but we can keep on taking through Jesus. We can hold up our heads high before our enemies and confront injustices. Through Jesus, we mm. no longer be ashamed in our own eyes, even if the enemy keeps trying to shame us. Through Jesus, we will mm. overturn money changers, race yeah. haters, gender abusers, <laughs> false race leaders, and the war of, of of war and injustice. So first things first, that this day is a moment of craziness, but it's also a moment of deliverance. This day is a moment when he takes down the very people who destroyed the church, the very people who would try to kill us in the church, but he conquers life and death. So get the first things first. It is by the authority of God it is by the authority of God. We too can speak to demons and not be afraid. It is under the authority of God that dead churches can come back to life. The lame shall walk, your blindness to injustice will see, and you will keep on believing, keep preaching, keep sharing, keep loving, keep giving, keep singing, keep praising, keep praying, keep serving, because you know what first things are. First things first. Jesus is the authority of our lives. Amen. 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 Am I next? So thank yes, you. Yes, you are. <laughs> All right. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, Bishop Ann Hinnon Byfield, for such a powerful message. Uh, and to all those whose names have already been called, uh, and I thank you all for being here with us tonight. 
uh, Bishop C. Wright, Supervisor C. Wright, and, and the Senior Bishop Richard Son. Thank you all. And for all my brothers and sisters who are here, thank you for being here tonight and thank you for your prayers. Sister Maddie um, and the sisters who put this together, thank you so much. Let us pray. Gracious God, stand up now. Continue to preach to the preachers. Let them hear your word in Jesus' name. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. Isaiah 49 verse 6. Uh, and it reads, it is not enough for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back the survivors of Israel. I will make you the light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And then we go to John chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. And uh, it reads, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is who I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be pleased if you do them. I'd like to talk to you from the subject, fear of Holy Week. Fear of Holy Week. The fear of Holy Week. The disciples are encountering our Lord in a very different way from his previous actions, particularly when compared to the events of Palm Sunday. Jesus is no longer a triumphant king. Rather, he is a servant. This chapter opens with our Lord washing the disciples' feet and comes to its climax with the account of the Last Supper which we will hear about and relive on Thursday night. But our Lord is not just a servant. Our Lord is a suffering and troubled servant. At the beginning of the passage, we are told that Jesus is troubled in spirit and his troubled spirit clearly causes some consternation for the disciples who are confused by his actions. The words of Jesus truly, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, sets off a reaction among the disciples, which shows that they are to an extent no longer moving in the same world as Jesus. They are uncertain of whom he spoke. Indeed, they are so confused that they ask Peter, the beloved disciple, what Jesus is talking about. But Peter, the, 
the love of disciple is not aware of what Jesus is talking about. Even after Jesus has moved, shared the morsel of bread with his betrayer, ignorance, confusion, and misunderstanding continue. The overall feelings of fear in the passion narrative all began to escalate during this chapter. People understand Holy Week in many different ways. For some, it's the time when they go to church a little more often and feel sorry for Jesus. More still will go to the liturgies of Palm Sunday and Easter Day without witnessing the life and death moments in between. Still for others, it's a genuinely engaging time when we come to understand something of the extent of God's love in the face of complete human fear and despair. Holy Week teaches us that we must overcome our detachment, a detachment which makes the cross a mere symbol. Like the disciples in the gospel, we too have to experience fear. We have to experience a form of brokenness. And just as was the case with the disciples, this feeling of brokenness is usually a sign that our own defenses, our own ideas of self-reliance are tumbling down around us. Unless we identify with the actions of the disciples of Jesus, we have not begun to understand Holy Week. Those who have encountered despair can best appreciate victory. Only the dead can appreciate resurrection. And all Christians must confront and experience the darkness as we move along the road to our own death. One thing which is most striking and yet most incidental of this account is found in verse 30. Immediately after Judas leaves the room to betray Jesus, the author tells the reader that night had fallen. Darkness had begun together. And we, like the disciples and indeed like Jesus himself, have to enter into this darkness of Holy Week. The gloom, uh, gloom of Gethsemane, the cloud and darkness of Good Friday, the pitch black of the tomb in this darkness we cannot see except by relying on Christ, who in the darkness becomes our true light. It's only by being in the darkness that we can come to understand Christ as the light. It is only by standing beneath the cross that we can understand the saving power. It's by entering the dark, standing beneath the cross, that we come to understand that the heart of our faith and discipleship is our reliance on Christ's light. This is most obviously expressed in the first reading. Jesus, who the words of the prophet Isaiah, in the words of the prophet Isaiah in today's first reading, foretells and becomes the servant in whom the Lord is glorified. It was as the prophet says, not enough for Jesus to simply bring back Jacob together Israel. Jesus' mission is not simply limited to Israel anymore. It's universal. I will make you the light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is a salvation which reaches out. Disciples always have and always will di display ignorance and fail Jesus and deny him. Some may even betray him in an outrageous and public way. But Jesus' never failing love for such disciples reveals the re uniqueness of salvation. Even the most hated person in the gospel in Christian tradition, Judas, is allowed to share in the Last Supper. This is what our salvation means. This is what it means to love totally and completely. This is a universal salvation which is proclaimed to islands and remotest coasts. This is a salvation which is truly glorified, not in the pomp of Palm Sunday, but in the darkness of fear and despair. This is a salvation which comes to us as a single flame proclaimed out of the darkness of Easter night. If we are to be true to our calling as Christians, we cannot shy away from the dark places of our lives. And there is none darker than the death of Jesus. We cannot be transformed or liberated other than at the foot of the cross. And neither can those to whom we seek to show Christ. To ignore the week of all weeks 
is to collude with the tendency of the world to run away from pain and fear altogether. As Christians, we have to offer the cross again and again to the most tiring aspects of people's lives. By sharing in the darkness and fear of the cypress, we can truly be said to be people who understand the power of the cross to speak to human pain. And as the only cure for the world's sickness, my brothers and sisters, as we go through this week, let us not just go through because it's Holy Week, but let us remember the cross. Jesus, our salvation. Amen. 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 Wow. Praise the Lord. Hmm. Thank you. Now, now at this time, we'll have our invitation to Christian discipleship by the Reverend Dr. Patricia Outlaw. Dr. Outlaw, if you can hear me, it's your time to do the invitation to Christian discipleship. I see your line in and it is unmuted. Since she is having difficulty, yeah. let me just go ahead and extend the invitation. We have heard two wonderful messages tonight. We have been blessed by these dynamic bishops of the church. And we come tonight to extend an invitation to anyone who wants to make a decision for Jesus to Christ. Jesus paid it all. He has done what needs to be done. Here we are celebrating what was done on the cross. But then remember, it was all done for you and I. For Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. My brothers and my sisters, if you want to make a decision, maybe you have a relative looking with you tonight who have been stirred by these wonderful messages and want to make a decision for Jesus Christ, come forth. You can also... Just simply bow where you are. And you can send us a text. You can send us a call. You can put it in the chat that tonight I have made up my mind to accept Jesus to Christ as my Savior. I've even made a recommitment to draw closer to Christ. I want to become a member of one of these African Methodist AME churches. You can do it tonight. You can make a decision. I pray and hope that you will do that. Our choir will lead us. Or there will be a selection. you got time. We'll take the time for you to make up your mind. Can we have one selection? Come to Jesus just now. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Just now. Just now. Oh, come to Jesus, come to Jesus just now. He is able, he is able, he is able just now, just now. Oh, he is able. Jesus is able, 
just now. Amen. Thank you you so very much. God bless you. Mm. Thank you, Bishop Seawright, and Mm. thanks to Bishop Ann Henning Byfield and Bishop Carolyn Tyler Guidry for those fantastic words of encouragement and reflection. I'm reminded of a song myself, I am satisfied with Jesus. And we say, I am satisfied, I am satisfied, I am satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me, when I think of Calvary, is my master satisfied with me? Mm. Amen. And at this time, we will have remarks and acknowledgments from our host pastors, Reverend Matty Edwards and and Reverend Monique Summers. Following those remarks and acknowledgments, we will have remarks and words of encouragement from Reverend Dr. Letitia Watford, presiding elder of the Tuskegee District, Reverend Dr. Willie Eugene Marshall, the presiding elder of the Ozark Troy District, uh, and of course, our own, the right Reverend Bishop Harry L. C. Wright, presiding prelate of the Ninth Episcopal District of the AME Church. And after our bishop's remarks, we will have closing remarks and benediction from our Preachers of the evening, Bishop Ann Hitting Byfield and Bishop Carolyn Tyler Guidry. Pastor Edwards. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you so much. And thank God for the word that we have heard on tonight. But truly, it was an awesome word. First of all, to my bishop, the uh, Reverend Dr. Harry L. C. Wright, and our supervisor, the Reverend Sherita Moon C. Wright. Also to Bishop Ann Hennon Byfield and Bishop Carolyn Tyler Gentry, along with Senior Bishop Adam J. Richardson. To my presiding elder, the Reverend Dr. Marshall, our candidate for bishop, and my former presiding elder, uh, Reverend Letitia Wofford. Uh, we say to God be the glory on tonight. Uh, and let me say this, the Reverend Monique Summer, she is the pastor of, of St. Luke AME Church located in Opelika, Alabama. And I am the pastor of Greater St. Paul located in Troy, Alabama. And so we also speak on their behalf and we greet you in Jesus name and with the love of God. We just express our gratitude for your participation and for the word especially and for how it has blessed our heart on tonight. I also thank my bishop for allowing us to come together uh, in order to do this each year. Of course, you know we can't do it without our bishop permission. And so we just thank him for allowing us to be work together and to um, be host pastors uh, for this event. And so to God be the glory. And we love you. Thank you for everything that you have done on tonight. God bless you. Will Reverend Summers be speaking? Reverend Summers? On her behalf. She's working behind Amen. the scenes. Oh, okay. very well. Yes. Um, this is Presiding Elder Watford. And indeed, it has been a pleasure to be in this service tonight. Uh, to the established protocol, all those I uh, know to call and don't know to call, Uh, Truly, we have been blessed tonight, Um, and I just thank you for this opportunity to greet each of you with the joy of Jesus. We look forward to sharing with you throughout the remainder of this week. May God continue to bless us all. Amen. 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 Thank you again to uh, Bishop Byfield and Bishop Gittry for both great words on tonight to thank you to my bishop bishop and supervisor C. Wright, to senior bishop Richardson and supervisor Richardson, uh, to all of the other bishops of the church and supervisors, to clergy and laity on all levels. Thank you so much for your support on tonight. Let me just say to my first pastor, my first pastor, Pastor Maddie Edwards, and to Reverend Somers, how proud I am of you. 
I for thank you for your leadership, you and Reverend uh, Summers. Thank you so much. Let me uh, acknowledge any candidates that may be on tonight. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, who I see, I see Dr. Clementine Warren from the 90 Episcopal District, who is a candidate for Judicial Council. I also see Dr. Moses Sim from Sims from the 8 Episcopal District, who is a candidate for Episcopal Service. And I was looking for Dr. G, G. Diane Lewis, who's also a candidate for Episcopal Service from the 90 Episcopal District. District. If there are any other candidates that are, are participating tonight, please acknowledge yourselves because we do not want to leave anyone out. Amen. Please acknowledge yourself if there are any other candidates. If not, thank you to everybody. Let us continue to pray for the revival. And thank you for this opportunity to greet the wonderful people of God. Amen. Um, out of respect for our senior bishop, we would just want to at least acknowledge him and see if he wants to say something um, before we close out. Bishop Richardson? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, Bishop C. Wright, thank you very much for the honor. I'm grateful to be here. Got a great word tonight. Got two great words tonight. Amen. And, uh, it only demonstrates what I've got to do, try to do tomorrow night. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, it's been a great night. I'm grateful to have been here. God bless you one Amen. and all. Amen. Amen. I tell Reverend Evans, she is the only person that I know that have approached bishops and even get two of them to preach on one night. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you again, Reverend Everson, to all of the committed persons. We're so grateful. Thank you all. We, we have thoroughly enjoyed this service. Looking forward to the rest of the week, tomorrow night, Wednesday, Thursday. Please pray for the preacher. I will be trying to bring a word. And then we pray and hope that everyone will have that resurrected power and joy on Easter Sunday morning. God bless each of you. Thank you all for participating and sharing. All of the people all over Facebook, thank you all. All right, we will now have the benedictions and any remarks I thank by the two bishops, okay? Yeah. And thank you, our worship leader tonight. Thank you so very much. We appreciate you always. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Dr. Roberts. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Bishop. <laughs> all right. Okay. Bishop Byfield. Um, yes, just wanted to thank you again for the opportunity um, to be a part of <coughs> this unusual and significant preaching um, um, opportunity. I recognize again my, my colleagues and particularly Bishop um, Gidry, who we share tonight. But Bishop Richardson, we're just so glad that we're preaching before you. So we Amen. About the word tonight. God bless you. And, um, have a good evening. Thank you again, Bishop Gidry. Uh, yes, what what my sister said. Thank you. Everything <laughs> ditto. And now, which one of you will lead us in the benediction? Bishop Henning Byfield. Oh, I thought somebody was programmed. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine upon you and give you the knowledge of first things first for today and the weeks to come. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the people of God say, Amen. 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 Good night and God bless. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. God bless everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you all for joining us. God bless. Good night, son. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you had to get it in there. Yes. <laughs> My baby over there. Hello. <laughs> I will. He, he hears you. He's standing over here in the corner. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night, Dr. Wofford. Good night. <coughs> <coughs> oh, Lordy.